Hello and welcome to Intelligence Squared with me, Philippa Thomas. Today we're going to take a wider view of how the struggle in Ukraine is reshaping world politics and we're going to encourage you to consider the bigger picture beyond the biggest global players, Russia, the US, China, to consider what our guest terms the middle powers like Turkey or India. Our aim today is to give you a more complete and nuanced picture of what's happening in geopolitics as it swirls around Ukraine. And we hope you'll help us in this hour's exchange by, uh, as was explained just now, uh, by using Twitter, by asking questions, by contributing your questions and comments. Well, I'm delighted to introduce our guest. He is political scientist Ivan Krushtev. Ivan is chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia. Uh, he is also uh, at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, and Ivan joins us today from Vienna. Uh, let me just say he's a founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations and a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. And he has many books out, uh, out in English, including uh, After Europe, and The Light That Failed, where you can uh, find out more about his thinking. But Ivan, it's a real pleasure to to meet you. I've read you, but not met you before. So it's great to have the yeah. chance for us to have a long conversation and kind of dig into some of these issues. Uh, I want to start by saying that in the UK, where I'm sitting, and in the US, the tendency is to look at Ukraine through the lens of Russian relations with the US, with NATO, with Europe, a bit of a rerun of a, of a Cold War focus. Uh, but there's much more to understand and many more players to factor in. So if you would, can we start with an overview of your idea of how complex this picture is? Listen, exactly. Uh, basically, how the war looks like is very much depends from where you see it. Seen from Europe and particularly big European countries, United States, this is the return of the Cold War. Uh, the enemy is the same. There is a clash between a democratic Ukraine and authoritarian Russia. Russians, when they started their special operations that turned into a war, were trying to convince the world that basically this is nothing. This is just a local conflict. Nobody else should be interested. And for the Ukrainians, this is very much a kind of a national liberation war. Uh, this is very much uh, an anti-colonial war. So interesting stories why all these narratives are mixing and how we're going to see the international order appearing looking at them listen of course it's a clash between democracy and authoritarianism but unlike in the case of the cold war you're going to see that many of the democratic countries which president biden invited for the summit of democracy were not in a hurry or eager uh, to sanction russia regardless of the fact that basically russia did something that was clear violation of a major principles of international relations. So while in Europe, we were very much trying to see the Cold War, these countries basically, regardless of the fact that probably they didn't like much what President Putin did, prefer to have a different position. And secondly, while many uh, friends of Ukraine believe that it is easy to go to the African countries and India and others and said, listen, this is a classical anti-colonial war. You should remember it. It was not very different to what happened to you. Many of these countries were saying, probably, but this is not our empires. Even more, some of the imperial powers we have been fighting against are now supporting you. So for me, the biggest story was then how to make a sense of this new situation. And what I start to realize is that while, of course, both United States and Russia and China uh, were trying to see this very much through the prism of a much more global picture, you have the rise of a middle powers. And I know that defining middle powers is not the easiest thing that can happen in the world, but it is either the size of the country or economic or military power or even geographical positions that very much incentivize and empower to use this conflict to try to assert how important they are for their regions, how important they are for international politics. And from this point of view, you see India, very much classical, biggest democracy in the world, going into a coalition with the United States uh, uh, in other contexts, 
but totally unwilling uh, to change its relationship with Russia, very much benefiting from buying discounted Russian oil. You see Turkey that is trying to position itself much more in a position of a mediator and trying basically have a NATO member state that is saying, yes, we support Ukraine, but uh, we're not going to sanction Russia. So this pushed me to believe that while we are trying to see the future as the world which is going to be shaped by China and the United States, that we're going to be back to the kind of a new second season of the Cold War, we're seeing something different. And all these middle powers, <coughs> for whom basically decolonization was more important than the Cold War, are starting to use it and to, in a certain way, both suffer from the crisis of international order, but also to enjoy the new importance that they're getting. So, Ivan, Turkey is a great example, I think, because Recep Tayyip Erdogan wants to be seen as a bigger leader globally. He wants to be of importance and perhaps of use. Uh, and so he's not prepared to take a role that uh, American-dominated NATO might want him to. He wants to define things for himself. Totally. And this is the most important, because these middle powers, this is not the kind of a third block. This is not return to the non-alignment movement. All these countries, they are competing with each other. They're very different on the level of interest, on the level of values, on the level of political regimes. But what is important for them is they, they want to reassert first their sovereignty, their political identity, but also the importance of the relevance for the international order. And you see, Mr. Erdogan, on one level, Turkey was the country that was the first to give drones to Ukraine. On the other side, Turkey was the country that said we are going to host Russian-Ukrainian negotiations. Turkey is a country which is not sanctioning Russia, and you're going to see a lot of Russians and a lot of Russian companies operating from Turkey. So this kind of a move in which... I'm using this crisis to say that I'm a sovereign power, that I have my own interest, and that basically you cannot simply treat me as the NATO member. It's very important for Turkey. But it's not only Turkey, look even at the Saudi Arabia, one of the traditional uh, allies uh, of the United States. Basically, during uh, the, the latest uh, OPEC discussions, they much more came with a policy which was beneficial for Russia. They went for a closer relationship with China. And on the other side of the same kind of a uh, process, you have Russia's traditional allies like Kazakhstan, like uh, 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 Armenia or Azerbaijan, which are also very much using this crisis not to stay uh, next to Russia, but basically to say, no, no, we are different. We have our own interest. We are going to play a totally different game and we are not ready to follow what Russia is going so, to say. So that's risky, isn't it? Whether you look at Kazakhstan and, yeah. and the mighty Russian bear, or you think, for example, about India, which is enjoying cut price Russian oil, but you know, has spent a long time establishing better relations with Washington and, and in a lesser, to a lesser extent with London. It's a risky business saying, mm, are you playing both sides? How are you going to be seen by the biggest powers? You're absolutely right. And this is interesting. And the fact that in many of these countries, basically, even when they are not uh, fully democratic, people are voting. It is a popular with the public. The idea that we're important, that we have sovereignty, nobody can tell us. We're not simply ally of one power or the other. It is important for the Turks. It is important for the Indians, but it is also important for the Kazakhs. And from this point of view, the political leaders are taking this risk. The risk is real because all this game, this middle power activism can also end up badly for them. Uh, but this is... The new thing that, in my view, we're missing when we're trying simply to explain what is going on in the framework of return to the Cold War. This is a type of behavior which was not so typical for the Cold War. This is a type of behavior in which we have too many countries which are big enough, powerful enough, in order to believe that they can have these games. Uh, and you said that it's risky. It is risky. Uh, it is risky on the other side, it is popular. And by the way, they're looking at each other, all these countries are saying, I can do it. I'm going to show to the Americans, to the Chinese, that we're important, that basically they should treat us specially. And the fact that I'm interested in my own interest and nobody else is becoming something very popular, particularly outside of, uh, of the West. And this is something new, and this is something that makes me to believe that, well, now everybody's saying what the Americans will do, what the Chinese will do, probably the future of the 
international order is going to be much more the result of the activism of these middle powers, which have different strategies, different resources. And the Americans and the Chinese are much more trying to basically keep the situation under control than to act as a kind of these architects of last resort. I will come to the Chinese, but to, to focus on the Americans for the moment, this requires, this reality requires more sophisticated and more flexible thinking. Um, and I'm aware from my American reporting of, you know, how much the US State Department, for example, was beaten down in the Trump years. And I would like your opinion on how ready or how nuanced you think American foreign policy makers uh, can be at this point. Interestingly enough, I do believe that uh, President Biden and his administrations were quite fast to adjust to this situation. Remember, just some months ago, he invited all these countries when he basically started his presidency on the Summit of Democracies. And then he looks around and majority of these countries are not sanctioning Russia. Uh, but what the Americans are doing, they didn't get outraged. They didn't tell to India, if you are not going to follow us, we are going to put you secondary sanctions. They're not telling the Turks what you're doing is totally unacceptable uh, because you see that the NATO member states like Poland and others have been very much threatened by this war. But they try to see how they can use and basically how they can arrange a situation in which even if these countries are not going totally to ally with them, at least that they're not going to play uh, uh, a game that is going to be destructive for the American long-term strategy. And I do believe this patience on the American side, which we didn't see in some other conflicts, this is very different than if you're not with us, you're against us, worked well. There was one case in which I do believe that uh, basically the White House lost its nerves, and this was after the Saudi Arabia very much came uh, with a cut of uh, oil production and with a policy that very much benefited Russia. But in my view, especially in this case also, the Biden administration has the right feeling that uh, this was a kind of early vote on the side of uh, uh, Saudi uh, leader in the uh, midterm elections in the United States. So he said it as a kind of a personal hostile act, as a policy that was very much meant to hurt the electoral chances of the Democratic Party on the elections. But otherwise, in my view, the United States is much more patient and much more understanding some of these sensitivities and resentment that you can expect uh, knowing some previous behavior. And we will come on to what could happen in the future in American politics and, and with other elections. But just looking at the the, the key power centers uh, and how you judge the way they're acting on Ukraine. What about Brussels? What about Europe? This is a conflict on their borders. So many Ukrainian, Ukrainians have fled. Um, you see this uh, you know, from your position. How do you rate the way that Brussels is reacting? Listen, for Europe, this was a major shock. Uh, and uh, this is something that people kind of from time to time underestimate, particularly when they're not living in Europe. It's not by accident that the most famous history of Europe in the second half of 20th century, Tony Judd's book, was called Post-War. Uh, European project did not simply come from the end of the World War II, but European project is very much rooted in the fact that a new major war is not possible in Europe anymore after the end of the Cold War. Europeans, we managed to convince ourselves that economic interdependence is the best way to secure the continent. We managed to convince ourselves that military power doesn't matter. And then suddenly, all this crashed in a day. And from this point of view, European reaction was uh, surprising to many. And European unity state, but this was also very much the result of the American position. And also, this was very much the result of the fact that suddenly, uh, Europeans who have been before it quite dismissive to the capacities and the willingness of the Ukraine to respond and to defend itself was very much mesmerized by the Ukrainian miracle. Listen, many Europeans, most of the Europeans, experts and not experts, while being highly critical to what President Putin was doing, were sure that he's going to succeed. And in my view, this was the power of the Ukrainian resistance created a moment which is very much transforming Europe. And this is what happened. And while this unity is there, of course, you're going to see major splits and 
kind of major differences both between the countries and within the countries. The East-West divide was very much exposed. You know very well that countries like Poland or the Baltic Republics were extremely critical to the way Germany and France have been uh, conducting their Russia policy in the last year. So from this point of view, it was a moment uh, of truth for Europe. Talking of moments of truth, do you think there's a potential parallel situation with China and Taiwan? In a certain way, this is this is uh, this is the interesting story, and this is the paradox. Because if you go before the war, and particularly if you see uh, uh, how the center of international political geopolitical gravity was moving from Europe to Asia, uh, you can see that this war was a kind of a strange war. Uh, uh, there is a lot of speculations how much the United States were interested or not interested in the war. But everybody who has been following American politics, he knew that the dream of the Biden administration was to park Russia in order to be able to concentrate on China and Taiwan. Because obviously, from the geostrategic point of view, from the logic of the major competition between China and Russia, Taiwan was the critically important and this is, by the way, the, uh, I was very much convinced that the decision of the American intelligence to start to publish on a daily basis the information that they have about the preparation of the war was very much based on the assumptions that President Putin, coming from the intelligence services, cannot start the war in the absence of surprise. And they were signaling to him, we're not surprised, we, we know what you're going to do. But the war started. And now when it started for the United States, but also for Europe, the idea is that this war should end the way to make a point for China that uh, in a certain way going to Taiwan is not a great idea. So this is why, nevertheless, that this conflict in a certain way is far away uh, uh, from Taiwan. It is very clear that everybody who is trying to understand how the end of the war is going to affect international politics all the time is making the parallels between Ukraine and Taiwan. And the only thing we know to expect is to expect change, the, uh, you know, the unexpected. Tai in Taiwan, in, in fact, there are several key elections coming up in the next uh, year or so. And in Taiwan, a kind of a rise in nationalism could affect this entire balance. <laughs> Totally. This is one of the interesting possibilities for us to make sense of what was going on. Normally, when we're thinking about 2023, we're trying to see how certain trends that we have seen in 2022 are going to continue or going to be disrupted. But particularly my understanding of the development of the situation is very much run by the idea that in order to understand 2023, we should be able to see it from the perspective of the 2024 and particularly from the perspective of several critical elections that are going to take place in 2024 and which are going to affect uh, the policies uh, uh, and the conduct of the war. Because this is the difference between the wars and the elections. We never know when the wars are breaking up. We don't know when they're going to end up. But it's, we know when basically the votes are going to be counted in certain places. So look at 2024. You're going to have presidential elections in both Russia and Ukraine in March 2024. You're going to have parliamentary elections, most probably in UK. You're going to have European elections for European Parliament. You're going to have elections in Taiwan, in which if you're going to have a pro-independence candidate winning, it's really going to affect very much also the way China is seeing, not simply what is happening in Taiwan, but what is happening basically also in Russia and Ukraine. And plus you have the American elections which are going to be critically important uh, for the way the American administration basically is going to behave with respect to this war. So in my view, strangely enough, ballot boxes these days is quite often the places where the war starts, but also the war ends. There is so much there. I want to pick up on some of those areas. And I also want to thank the audience because questions are already coming in. And I'm going to remind you that we're going to leave a lot of space for your questions and you can ask a question by clicking on ask question and remember tell us your name if you want us to to quote you or to say where you are uh, you can also tweet about the conversation that we're having with Ivan Khrushchev uh, using the hashtag IQ2 but let's go back to elections and what's coming up let's go to Russia I mean who dares oppose Putin in any major sense is he vulnerable politically do you think 
Listen, interestingly enough, of course, the popular saying is that there are two things that you cannot choose in Russia, your president and your parents. Uh, but what is critically important is that while Russia is not a democracy, elections have been always very important for the legitimation of President Putin. Every election was serving to show the people that there is no alternative to Putin. And on these elections, uh, this is not simply, is there going to be a candidate? I don't believe that the elections are going to be organized if Putin is running, uh, that uh, he's going to lose the elections. But for the first time, President Putin is going to be challenged, not so much from those who said, why did you start this stupid war? But also of those who are saying, why you are not winning this bloody war? So for the first time, the criticism to Kremlin are coming not simply from the liberal sources, but also from a much more extreme nationalistic position saying, OK, you started, but why you're not winning? And this creates a moment of vulnerability. It also creates a moment of vulnerability because Russian population was kind of quite ready to live with the idea of the special operations, something like the large version of Crimea, uh, where basically the Russian army goes, succeeds in several weeks, and the people are just going to cheer it in the way you're cheering as a football team. But now you have a mobilization, and probably you're going to have a more mobilization, and probably there are going to be more than half a million young men that are going to be thrown uh, to the battlefield, and many of them are going to be killed. This is a different social contract. And from this point of view, President Putin is vulnerable and he should try to find a way to explain to the Russians why this war is taking place. Of course, his major narrative is that he's not fighting Ukraine, he's fighting the West. But if he's fighting the West, what is the victory? And in my view, this story to explain the people what is a victory and why they should suffer is going to be very difficult. And this is why the election campaign is a moment of vulnerability. And my feeling is that the Russian uh, uh, leaders, uh, the Russian leader knows very well this. And when we think about what leaders are offering their people, Zelensky is popular, of course. Uh, he didn't flee, he stayed, he's leading day by day. But at the same time, he's limited in any change he can offer. I'm, I'm I assume that it's going to be very hard for him to say, look, we should talk to the Russians when facing re-election himself. Totally. And from this point of view, it's very important that for Ukraine, first, it's very important to organize the elections. And listen, it is not easy. You're organizing the elections in a country in which the majority of the population is not living in the places in which they have been living in the day the war started. Some have been emigrated, are they going to vote? Some have been moved because of, uh, of occupation and uh, uh, because of the distractions. So first, and it's critically important for Ukraine to show the infrastructural capacity to organize the elections. And secondly, uh, of course, President Zelensky is very popular, but President Zelensky is very popular because he's telling his own people, I'm not going to go on any compromise. I'm not ready to do any type of a territorial concession. The moment he said, OK, let's see what kind of concession I can do, be sure that there are going to be another candidate which is going to run on the elections and saying, no, this is not what we have been talking about. You have told to the people that we're going to liberate all our territory. And this makes me believe that for the same reasons we discussed about Russia and Ukraine for both countries. It's going to be very difficult first to have any meaningful negotiations in 2023. And secondly, there is not good even possibility for the conflict to freeze in 2023. Because in the elections in 2024, to a great extent, are defining what is possible and what is not possible. And of course, what is happening on the ground is the most important. And in the wars, what is deciding decisive is really uh, 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 what uh, uh, the armies are doing. But this kind of a very important constraints may it is very clear that President Zelensky is under strong pressure to stay where he is and to do what he has promised to do. And to be honest, this is also true uh, for President Putin, who is insisting we are winning, this is our land, and so on. And obviously, he's not winning at the moment, but he should try to convince uh, his own population that he's doing this. So I'm saying this because this type of a perspective from the elections is not going to tell us what is going to happen, but probably is going to help us to understand what is not likely to happen. It seems a long time until we get to the US election, even though we know the campaigning starts pretty soon. But 
even looking towards November 2024 and a possible return of Trump or simply return of a Republican candidate uh, who's not inclined to fund and back Ukraine. I suppose that looms over Ukraine, doesn't it, in the sense that without US backing, without that military backing, it's so much harder to keep going. Totally. Listen, uh, Ukrainian army is really giving an incredibly uh, 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 impressive fight, but they cannot uh, succeed in the absence of uh, American weapons, and they cannot succeed, uh, succeed in the absence of the financial support coming from outside. 30% of the economy of the country is destroyed, basically. There are cities that do not function. So from this point of view, this is critically important. And this is interesting. It's not simply that Republicans can say, we're not going to give you more weapons. This is not so easy to be done. But during the election campaigns, uh, what probably the Republican candidate, and by the way, nevertheless, who he is, who probably to do is said, oh, yeah, it's Putin war, but it's also Biden's war. And President Biden is going to be very strong press not to allow two things to happen. If basically Ukraine Online. is going to there lose, go. he, of course, is going to be under strong pressure. But secondly, on the other side, the American public is not interested in the American troops to take part in the war. So this is why for Biden is extremely important America to win, uh, Ukraine to win, but at the same time, the Americans to be sure that we are not moving to the World War Three. So for all these players, as I was trying to, uh, to show, they are very important constraints and very important things that they want and they don't want to happen just on the eve of the elections. Let's bring in some of what our audience has been bringing to the conversation because they're very engaged. And actually, there's a lot of questions on your idea of the middle powers reasserting themselves. And I think one is, so Bettina asks, for example, do you see the middle powers grouping together, aligning? And I think actually that's not what you're saying, no, isn't it? But, no. but do explain. Listen, I don't see them aligning. Funnily enough, they're also competing very much with each other. What they share very much is the desire to be at the table. Because what middle powers has learned is that when you're not at the table, you're at the menu. Uh, and this is what they really want to change. But at the same time, they're neither coming with common ideas outside of the ideas that they're going to have and should play a much more important role. No, they're basically sharing the same interests. Because some of this middle powers are also in a competition with each other. Uh, and this is the interesting story about it. As I said, middle powers is not the return of the non-alignment movement. Uh, as you know, some of these middle powers are aligned powers. Turkey is a member of NATO. What is important for all of them is to show that their foreign policy is very much formulated and very much decided in their own capitals, and they have the capacity uh, at least if not to shape the world, to shape their regions. So you have a lot of ambition, you have a lot of activism. From time to time, these powers, of course, can end up uh, uh, with a certain ad hoc coalition on certain issues, but there is also a lot of competition and a lot of mistrust between the middle powers themselves. For example, for sure, Israel is a middle power. Iran is a middle power too. Turkey is a middle power. So uh, even just in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia is a middle power. All these countries you're not going to see basically going together and enjoying one and the same policy. But the only thing that is critical in the behavior of the middle power is that they don't believe that they're going to be benefit if the world simply go back to the Cold War as they knew it. This is a great question from Claire. Who do you think will be the most important middle power in the next 10 years?